<clears throat> Amen. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. What a great song. And uh, that song just goes so well with the uh, message for this evening. I'm so thankful when that happens. Uh, good evening. It's good to be back with you. And thank you. Uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, not everyone that hears me preach comes back to hear me again. And so thanks for being here. It's a joy to be with you. And I just want to again say uh, thank you for such the, uh, a warm welcome. You have really rolled out the red carpet for us. You've made, them, made us feel uh, right at home and you've taken great care of us. And, uh, you know, we, we are in a lot of churches as missionaries are. We're on deputation. We're in a lot of missions conferences. And, you know, there are churches that tell you, Amy and I were just talking about this recently, there are churches that tell you that they love missionaries, and then there are, are churches that show you that they love missionaries, and you are that type of church, and, and we just appreciate you so, uh, so very much. And again, thank you, Pastor Folger, for the opportunity. It means so uh, very much. I am well aware that uh, every missionary could uh, be preaching, and we, I, I would just learn so much. Uh, I, I love the, the Mickeys, and uh, they're, they're, um, our church at Mount Vernon has had the privilege of supporting them, and, and I, I just uh, love to be around him and talk to him and appreciate him very much, and the birds, uh, getting to know them, and boy, they have uh, so much uh, wisdom and knowledge, and, and uh, so it's great to be around these missionaries looking forward to um, just furthering uh, getting to know them better throughout the, the week. Uh, take your Bibles, please. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9. And while you're turning there, uh, let me just say a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, when you're 47 years old, you've been a pastor for 15 years, and then all of a sudden you're a missionary on deputation. All kinds of funny things happen. You know, it's, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, they say. And sometimes, and, and I can tell you this now because you already support us, all right? But sometimes we feel like, Amy and I joke, we're like, we're the worst missionaries in the world, I'll tell you, because, uh, you know, we just are new at this, and, and boy, and, and so many things happen to us uh, while we're on the road. Now, some of those things that happen to us on the road, some of them we're able to share with you publicly. We can't tell you everything because, uh, boy, just all kinds of things happen, but I'll just share one story with you. Uh, we were in a large church here in Ohio, and it was just like our first few months of deputation. We're still brand new, still learning the ropes, uh, still trying to learn everything, all the do's and the don'ts. And, and, and so uh, we're in this large church. It's about 10 minutes before the opening night of Missions Conference. And uh, our family's sitting in about five rows back up here on this side. And uh, it's just right about before the services to begin. And I go up to uh, find my chair, my seat, and, and my son, Chad. Now, Chad's not with us, but he, 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 uh, he's sitting there, and he has his phone out. Chad is our third son. I have five boys, no hair. There is a connection there. All right. And so Chad's there. He's got his phone out, and he's obviously videotaping. He's, like, recording. Uh, and so I go up to him, I say, Chad, what are you doing? He goes, recording mom. Well, I look up to the front and right up here, my, Amy, my wife, she's talking to a lady. And so I said, uh, okay, uh, I give up. Why are you recording mom? And he goes like this, he goes, because she doesn't know she's talking to a deaf woman. And so, uh, so here's what's going on. I look up there and my wife, she's just talking and smiling and her hands are going. She'd been talking for a couple minutes and this woman can't understand anything she's saying. And she's just looking at Amy going, okay, okay, all right. Now you say, that's horrible, brother Bill. How in the world would you just tell a story like that about your wife? Well, it gets better. Same missions conference, three days later, I walk up to a man that I thought was deaf, okay? Now, I, um, I had been to the Bill Rice Ranch. I had taken some teenagers to the Bill Rice Ranch. They were, they were deaf teenagers. I know a little bit of sign language. I go up to this man. I, I just thought for sure he was there. I go up to him. I go, hi. He goes, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm doing, thanks for asking. So anyway, uh, I don't know what it is about, about uh, the deaf section. As a matter of fact, we were here a year ago, January, and we, we didn't know the deaf section over here. We were sitting right up here, and uh, my, my, my second and my third son, Drew, some of you know Drew, and Chad were sitting there, and it was about five minutes before the service here at Cleveland Baptist Church, Sunday night, and Drew leans over to Chad. He goes, I think we're in the deaf section. 
Chad goes, why are you whispering, dummy? <laughs> and so anyway, I don't know what it is, but anything and everything that can happen while you're on deputation seems to happen to the Fennel family. But anyway, uh, just a quick review as we get into our text tonight. Uh, I just want to remind you again about the Great Commission. It just, it's the reason why we're here. It's the reason we have missions conference so many believers, so many Christians just think, just believe that the Great Commission is just one more, just, just uh, uh, one more rule for living. And it certainly is something that we need to obey. It's something that we need to do. But I want you to understand it's more than that. It's more than another, it's more than another rule for living. It is our reason for living. It is why we are here. It is our job. It is our responsibility. It is our duty. We will someday give an account and answer to God, our Heavenly Father, for what we personally have done with the Great Commission. And so I personally believe that every Christian, every believer, every blood-bought child of God needs to uh, ask themselves specifically uh, what is my relationship to the Great Commission? And I think these are three wonderful questions to ask regarding the Great Commission. Number one, this is a review from last night. Number one, am I surrendered to go and take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world? I think every Christian needs to ask themselves that question, number one. Number two, uh, if God does not call me to go to the uttermost, am I willing to sacrifice so that others may go? You know, if, if I don't go, then I need to give so that others can go. And then number three, am I soul conscious here in my Jerusalem, in my circle of influence, in my world that God has given to me, the people that I come in contact uh, with every day. And so I hope and pray uh, that you will be uh, uh, looking at the Great Commission in that way, praying about what God would have you to give to missions in the upcoming year. And uh, we praise the Lord again for missions and the missions conference and the privilege to be here. Look with me at Acts chapter 9. And uh, we want to uh, just continue a truth that was laid out this morning for us very clearly, very plainly this morning in the morning service. Uh, and uh, so we want to look at uh, this idea of surrender tonight. Look with me at Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto uh, Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into that city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. By the way, the Lord answered that question in verse 15. Look at verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Here, here it is, the answer to the question to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Going back to verse 6, notice what it says again, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Tonight, let's look at this truth uh, from this text. I surrender all. I surrender all. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together tonight. Father, we love you and Thank you again for the privilege of being in your house tonight. We thank you for how our hearts have been encouraged already by being with brothers and sisters in Christ and finding strength and comfort and encouragement uh, as iron sharpeneth iron. We thank you for, again for the, the, the wonderful uh, music that stirs our hearts and prepares us for uh, your word. Uh, Father, we just pray tonight that you would use the power of your word and the power of your spirit Again, Father, to do something spiritual in our hearts, in our lives, and in our marriages, our families, our church family, and again, our circle of influence. 
And Father, we just pray that uh, you would use uh, this time together tonight in a, in a great way that decisions would be made that would last for eternity. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was a freshman in college. I was coming home for Christmas break. I had two friends with me in my vehicle, and I was driving all the way home into the wee hours of the morning to New Hampshire, my home state. And about 10 o'clock at night, uh, we had, uh, 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 you know, gotten into New England and we, we had another hour and a half or so uh, uh, to drive. And uh, immediately after crossing uh, the New Hampshire state line, we were immediately pulled over by uh, not one state trooper, but five state troopers. Uh, they immediately surrounded our little car and they put their uh, spotlights on us. And then they uh, drew their guns and told us to put our hands up in the air and not to make any sudden movements. Well, what had happened, to make a long story short, is that three men in the state of Maine had robbed a bank. And they had gotten away in a vehicle that was absolutely positively identical to the car that I was driving. It was the same make and model, the same year, the same color everything, and there were three of us in the car. So these state troopers just knew for certain they had caught the bank robbers. Well, they interrogated us. They questioned us. And uh, it wasn't long before they found out that we weren't smart enough to rob a vending machine, <laughs> let alone a bank, and they chuckled and sent us on our way. Well, uh, here's the, the, the point to that little story. When the guns were drawn and the demands were made to put our hands up in the air, uh, we had a decision to make. Not really much of a decision, but we could have made one of two choices. We could have been stubborn or we could have surrendered. We could have struggled or we could have surrendered. We could have done this or we could have done this. Well, I think, again, that you would agree with me that it's not really much of a decision. <laughs> I think you would agree that we did the right thing. And uh, to make an, a, an analogy, though God, our Heavenly Father, does not hold us at gunpoint and make us surrender, uh, I think that you would agree with me that it's a very foolish Christian that fights with God over God's will for our life. And like the Apostle Paul, I believe every Christian, every Christian must come to a point in their life where they are surrendered. Amen. A point in their life where they say, in effect, like the Apostle Paul, Lord, what will thou have me to do? A point in our life where we say, God, I surrender all. And so with that in mind, let's take a few minutes tonight and look at some aspects of surrender, some aspects of surrender. Number one, the meaning of surrender, the meaning of surrender. I, I believe that it, it, it's very true that we could ask uh, 10 preachers and get probably 11 answers on their definition of surrender. But uh, just to make it extremely simple tonight, I'm a pretty simple-minded guy. You don't need to amen or comment on that. But I think that surrender is just basically this. It's the moment in a believer's life where they communicate to God that they're willing to do whatever He wants them to do. It's that time in our life where we really communicate consecration to the Lord. It's a time in our life where we communicate a commitment to consecration to the Lord. And uh, I think of the Apostle Paul in our text, very unusual situation, though it shouldn't be. The Apostle Paul, if you think about it, he was saved and surrendered all at the same time. And that does happen. It's not uh, always like that. But, but the moment he got saved, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What will thou have me to do? And really, that's what surrender is. Surrender is like William Booth, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, who said at one point in his life, he, he came to a, 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 an Acts 9-6 in his life where he said, Lord, uh, you can have everything that there is in this man, William Booth. And so, uh, again, surrender is the moment when you and I as believers say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm all yours. I surrender all. 
uh, my life is yours to control. And I believe uh, that we need to surrender regardless of two things. Number one, regardless of our past. You know, the Apostle Paul has really removed all excuses for someone to say, you know, my past is so sinful that I, I really can't surrender to whatever God would have me to do. The Apostle Paul went from, as Galatians tells us, he went from a persecutor of Christ to a promoter of Christ. So again, he's removed all excuses. No one can say my life was so bad that God cannot use me in the future to do something for him. Uh, Paul re removes all uh, uh, excuses for that. And we need to surrender, number two, regardless of talents and abilities or lack thereof. Someone might think, well, I don't have a whole lot to offer. I, I mean, the Apostle Paul was the cream of the crop. And by the way, think about that for just a moment. We often have this idea of the Apostle Paul that, that um, you know, God only used him because he was gifted and talented and all of that. Think about that for just a moment. We think, well, the Apostle Paul had to be the greatest preacher in all of the world. And there's no question he was a powerful preacher. But think about this. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1, Paul said, when I came unto you, I came not with what? Excellency of speech. Uh, we think, well, uh, God only used Paul because he was so intelligent and so educated. And yet in Philippians chapter 3, uh, what did Paul say? He said, I count that but dung that I might win Christ. He didn't put a whole lot of stock in his, his intelligence and education and background, though God used him with that. We think, well, the Apostle Paul, you know, he just reached a point of sinlessness. He never sinned, and there's no question about it. I believe the Apostle Paul was a holy Christian, a consecrated Christian, and yet what did he say in Romans chapter 7? The things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I wind up doing, oh, wretched man that I am. And so uh, we can't use our talents and abilities or lack thereof to say, God, you could never use me, so I'm not going to surrender. I love this story. I recently heard a story about a woman in India who was blind, and she trusted Christ as her Savior, and, and uh, she asked her preacher. She knew that she needed to do something for God. She asked her pastor for a Bible, and so the pastor gave her a Bible. He was curious about that. She couldn't read the Bible, but he gave her a Bible. She said, would you underline John 3.16 for me? He said, sure. She took the Bible. She marked that place in John. She went to the local public school. It was a boys' school. She sat at the step every day before school got out. And as the boys would file out of that uh, door, she would ask some of them uh, to stop, and she would say, do you know how to read? They would say, yes. She would say, would you read this underli these underlined words for me? They would read and she would say, do you know what that means? They would often say no. She would say, do you want to know what that means? And they would oftentimes say yes. She led dozens upon dozens of young men to the Lord. And as the story goes, when she passed away, 27 of those men were in full-time Christian service. You see, God just wants us to be surrendered. God, I know we've, we've heard this before, the greatest ability is dependability, but right along with that is, is availability. We just need to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And God will reveal to us what he wants us to do. And so we need to get to a point in our life where we have a moment where we just say, God, I am yours. Regardless of our past, regardless of our talents and abilities and what we think we have and don't have, we just need to say, God, my life is yours uh, to control. Number two, if you're taking notes, consider this with me, the motive for surrender. I want to give you two. Uh, no doubt we could search the Bible and, and come up with others. Let me just give you two. Two motives for surrender. Number one, God's glory. And number two, our gratitude. Number one, God's glory. It's a wise Christian that realizes that we exist to bring honor and glory to Almighty God. We exist to bring a smile to the face of God more than we exist to bring a smile to our face. It's a wise Christian that realizes, as it says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, that all things are and were created for his pleasure. And then to go a step further, as saved individuals, as blood-bought children of God, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, we've been bought with a price, therefore we ought to glorify God in our body and our spirits, which are God's. 
We need to get to a point where we realize that this is not all about me. It's all about him. And I exist to bring glory to God. By the way, what does that mean? To bring glory to God simply means to reveal and reflect the attributes of God to a lost and dying world. Why? Why? So that they may see our good works and in turn glorify our Father which is in heaven. That's why we exist. We exist to bring glory to God. Number two, our gratitude. Why do we surrender? God's glory, our gratitude. This morning, the reference was uh, given of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. That's what we're talking about. Surrender. Presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is just our reasonable service. Uh, Dr. Richard Folger used to say, Pastor Folger used to say, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you better look and see what it's there for. And so I want you to just think about that therefore in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore. Therefore connects everything that was before it to everything after it. Now think about this, church family, tonight. What do we have before Romans chapter 12? We have 11 chapters that reveal to us salvation to a lost and dying world. We have verses like uh, uh, Romans uh, 5, 8, but God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Listen, when you look at chapters 1 through 11, which we often refer to uh, as the Romans wrote in there, we have a whole lot to be thankful. And so when you get to chapter 12 and it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What is being said there is this. When you consider God's mercy, hey, it's just our reasonable service to present our life a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Truly, our giving is in direct proportion to our gratitude. I love this story. I heard this story one time about a man in the early stages of our country who went out west to minister to the Native Americans. He gathered a large crowd of Native Americans under a tent and he began to preach the gospel to them. Well, an Indian chief happened to just be going by and saw the crowd and went to the back of the crowd to hear what this man had to say. And this young preacher was preaching about how good God is and how God loved the world. This Indian chief was so moved by a God that actually loved us, that actually loved mankind, that this Indian chief walked the aisle in the middle of the sermon, gave his blanket to the preacher and said, Indian chief, give his blanket to this God. Well, that preacher kept on preaching and he said how God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. In other words, Jesus Christ, God's son, left the throne room of heaven and came, was born in Bethlehem's manger and lived as a human being uh, 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 for 33 years. That Indian chief again was so moved, he walked forward during the service. He handed his tomahawk to the missionary. He said, Indian chief, give this tomahawk to this God. That missionary kept on preaching. He had to be an independent Baptist. You know, you keep preaching, they keep giving, just keep preaching. So he kept preaching. And he talked about how the Lord Jesus Christ lived a sinless, perfect life and then went, on, went to the cross of Calvary and gave his life for the sins of the world. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And boy, that Indian chief was so moved. He came forward. This is true. He, he literally grabbed the reins of his horse, walked down the aisle, handed the reins to the preacher and said, Indian chief, give his horse to this God. That missionary just kept on preaching. He talked about how the Lord Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He was buried and then hallelujah, he rose again victorious over sin and death and the devil. And if you put your faith and trust in Christ in him, you can have forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven. And boy, that Indian chief was so moved, he came forward again, nothing in his hands. Tears streaming down his face. He fell at the missionary's feet and he said, Indian chief, give his life for this God. Truly, our giving is in direct proportion to our gratitude. 
Why is it that we ought to have a moment in our life where we, we communicate a commitment to consecration? Why is it that we have a moment in our life where we say, I surrender all? It's because of two reasons. God's glory and our gratitude. Number three tonight, I want you to consider this with me. The manifestation of surrender. Now, really, now really, this is the sermon. You say, well, wait a second. This really is the sermon. The first two points were introduction. But I, I want you to consider with me the evidence or the proof of surrender. See, this is for someone who maybe at one time walked an aisle and said, Brother Bill, Pastor Folger, I got that taken care of. I can check that off my list. I went forward one time in a service and I told God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. If that's true, church family tonight, listen, there should be some evidence to that. So let's look at some evidence of surrender. Number one, if we are truly surrendered, we are submissive. Look with me at verse number six. And he, trembling and astonished, said, what's that next word? Lord. Master. It's as if the Apostle Paul, upon saying Lord, Master, is falling down on his feet and saying, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. It's as if the Apostle Paul is kicking self off the throne of his heart and putting the Savior there where he rightly deserves to be. Submissiveness. Submissiveness. You know, we often teach to our young people, and I believe it's a biblical principle, that if we're not right, if they're not right with their parents, they're not right with God. But you know, that's true for adults as well. If we're not, if we're rebelling against the, the authority that's over us, then we're rebelling against the authority that is God. What are you saying, Brother Earl? What I'm saying is, if, if you're not right with your pastor, you're not, you're not right with God. If you're not right with your boss, you're, right, you're not right with God. If you're not right with the government, you're not right with God. Because those are authorities that God has placed over us. And if we're always bucking the system and we're always going the opposite direction and there's always conflict in our life, then listen, it, it, it's very possible that's evidence that you're not really surrendered to whatever God would have you to do. Submission. In other words, if God can't soften your heart enough to work in the nursery or join the choir or teach a Sunday school class, what makes us think that we're surrendered to go to the uttermost parts of the world? Submission, number one. Another evidence of surrender is this, service. Service. Look with me again at our text. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? I know that's a question, but it's a statement. I, I know it's a question. There's a question mark there. I know I, I did good in grammar. Okay, I did well in grammar. I, I know it's a question, but it's more of a statement. It's a statement of, ser of, of service. Lord, what do you want me to do? Just let me know and I'll do it. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I, I went forward one time and I, I just told the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And so again, I can check that off the list. And, and, and so I, I told God, I'm willing to go to the uttermost and serve him. And yet you're not serving him here. That does not compute. That does not make sense. Two plus two does not equal four. If we're surrendered to do whatever God would have us to do, if we're surrendered to go to the uttermost, that means we're surrendered here. That means if we're willing to go across the globe and serve God and have a ministry there and witness to people there, then we ought to serve God here and have a ministry here and witness to people here. Service is evidence of surrender. Number three, Sacrifice. Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, verse 6, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And look with me at verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings 
and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And by the way, the Apostle Paul did suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yea, verily, even giving his life for the cause of Christ. You can't ask for much more than that. And so again, I don't want to be unkind. I don't want to be unloving. But let me just get us to contemplate and think about something for just a moment. If you at a particular time in your life surrendered to whatever God would have you to do, then there should be some evidence in your life of that surrender. There should be submissiveness. There should be service. There should be sacrifice. Well, well, I'm willing to go to the uttermost parts of the world and give my life to a certain people group. Listen, are you giving your life here? That's evidence of salvation or, or evidence of surrender. Uh, people say, well, I think, it, you know, if God called me to be a missionary, uh, I would give my life for the Lord. I would die for the Lord. Wait a second. You're not living for the Lord here. So may God help us to discern. That's all. Discern in our life if we're really surrendered to do whatever God would have us to do. And we end with this, the moment of surrender. We talk about the meaning of of surrender, the motive for surrender, the manifestation of surrender. Is there evidence in your life that you're truly surrendered? And number four, the moment of surrender. Again, in, he, in, in, in uh, Acts 9, 6, here we have the Apostle Paul who gets saved and surrendered all at the same time. And I wonder, has there been an Acts 9, 6 in your life? An Acts 9, 6 in your life. I, I remember hearing a story about a great youth rally in some part of our country where thousands of teenagers met and they took up a special love offering for some project that was to get the gospel to the othermost parts of the world. I don't know the specifics about that. And so an offering was, uh, play, was passed and there was money that had been given and, and they were collecting it. And, and some of the men that were counting the money, they were going through all of the, all, all of the cash and all of the change and they came across a, um, a school photo of a young lady, a teenage girl, like a, a wallet-sized picture that you would receive in, in your school. And one of the men thought, well, you know, probably one of the teenage boys, were, they were just goofing around. They took the picture and threw it in the offering plate just to, as a joke. And they thought that until they turned it over. And on the back of the picture, it said this. I have nothing to give, but I give myself. And that was that young lady's, that, that young lady's way of saying, I surrender all. That was that young lady's way of saying, Lord, what will thou have me to do. Has, been, has there been a time in your life that you've surrendered your life to whatever God would have you to do?